Yeah, since he's a uh, Ambassador Qingang's arrival in the United States, the first thing he did is to set up uh, a Twitter account, which shows you know he's very well uh, aware you know how to communicate uh, with with American leaders and American people. So this uh, tweet on uh, Panda a Little Miracle is just one of a series of tweets Ambassador Qin has sent out. Each of them is very positive uh, on US-China relations. So I actually uh, wrote a commentary on how uh, Ambassador Qin has turned a new page in trying to communicate a very positive message to the American people uh, to express to them the sincere and keen desire on the part of the Chinese government and on behalf of the Chinese people that uh, bilateral cooperation is very important between these two nations. You know, Panda obviously plays a very important role. I remember when Atlanta Zoo uh, wanted to have pandas, uh, President Carter even wrote a letter to then Chinese leaders and finally uh, Chinese government agreed to lease a couple of pandas to the Atlanta Zoo, which became a real hit over here. Uh, UPS, which is uh, headquartered over here, uh, even sent a special plane called uh, Panda Express uh, to get the two pandas here to Atlanta. We all know that uh, Chinese companies, both uh, SOEs and private companies have been trying uh, to raise money here in the US. Since President Trump uh, came to power uh, in uh, 2017, uh, there have been uh, regulations uh, on the part of the US, particularly companies that the US government perceives that are having connections with Chinese military, they've been delisted. But even in that background, some private companies from China continue uh, to go IPO here in the US. I think there is a, a conviction uh, on the part of the Chinese business community that uh, it's easier and quicker to raise money uh, from, from the individuals, but mostly probably from a pension fund and, and other investing groups here in, in the US. Now, DD obviously uh, showed that uh, the Chinese government may have second thought on allowing Chinese companies uh, to go IPO here. I think there, there, there might be two concerns. One concern is, you know, for example, DD uh, is, is a company that controls big data. So the Chinese government is concerned uh, where this data is gonna go. Is, is this data uh, protected? You know, because this data, once uh, being uh, analyzed, could certainly be used to determine uh, a lot of things in China, such as the trajectory of economic growth. I think there was even an article uh, using uh, DD data to determine uh, how Chinese civil servants, you know, if they're working uh, over time. The second concern, I think probably, uh, as, as uh, serious as, as the first concern is if China's uh, innovation companies like DD uh, and, and others are being controlled by foreign capital. You know, if they're controlled by foreign capital, then there, there is this national security issue. So you see the trend that both the US and, and China are doing a lot of things to securitize, national securitize the businesses, which I, I think uh, is, is a dangerous trend because if you do too much of, of that, then normal uh, business transactions between the two countries are, are going to be uh, interrupted. And, and that's not going uh, to be good for, for both countries. The final uh, issue I want to raise over here uh, is China's uh, approach to DD uh, has obviously offended a, a very important special interest group in the US, uh, which has been supporting engagement policy in the past. And that special interest group, we could call it uh, the, the investor group, big uh, pension fund, private equity firms, 
you know, firms like Goldman Sachs and, and others, they, they have made a lot of money by uh, helping Chinese companies to, to, go, to go IPO or by investing uh, in, uh, in these uh, companies. Now, if China is gonna cut this off, then this uh, one of the important pillars of US-China engagement probably will, will, will uh, disappear. As uh, someone who uh, observes uh, this relationship, you know, all all these years, you know, I'm I'm a, a sort of a member of the special interest groups of U.S.-China relations. Had it not been for normalization of U.S.-China relation, you know, I'm I'm not going to be here. Uh, my kids are are not going to be here, and uh, so. Uh, the, the better the relationship, the more we're going to benefit, not just, you know, me, myself, but also all the uh, Chinese Americans, you know, all the uh, Chinese nationals, you know, all the Chinese companies, uh, you know, they're all going to benefit from here. So since 2017, you know, the relationship, particularly since the beginning of 2018, the relationship has been in the free fall. Uh, and we all hoped that uh, with the present Biden in the White House, uh, a new page is going to be turned. So that page has yet to be turned. And uh, to, to a large extent, uh, President Biden has inherited uh, President Trump's uh, legacy or uh, the China policies. And, and probably uh, he, President Biden has made it even harder uh, by uh, drawing other countries into this alliance. Uh, that are working together uh, to contain uh, China. However, I think both sides uh, have uh, realized that uh, to allow this most consequential relationship uh, to get into this kind of free fall uh, is, is a huge danger. Uh, and there, there is this increasing risk of, of confrontation uh, between the two countries. So that's why uh, before uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Wendy Sherman's visit to China, the US side started talking about guardrails uh, of the relationship. I think uh, Secretary Wendy Sherman also made it very clear, you know, US uh, certainly will compete with China, but competing with China doesn't mean uh, to have a conflict with, with China. So how to avoid uh, conflict? Uh, I, I think it's very important for the two top leaders to meet. So I, I hope uh, in October, uh, President Biden and President Xi will be able to meet, uh, not online, in person, in Rome, uh, to, to discuss issues. You know, President Biden and President Xi know each other very well. Uh, they hosted each other in both countries. Uh, they had hours of conversation with, with each other. So it is long due. Uh, for them to work out uh, things, you know, what the U.S. want, what China can do, and what does China want, or what U.S. can do. If uh, you watch carefully the, the rhetoric of, of the leaders, uh, particularly the rhetoric of the Chinese leaders, you know, they talk about potential and necessary U.S.-China collaboration first in the area of pandemic, uh, second, in the area of climate change. Third, uh, in the area uh, of the Korean Peninsula denuclearization. And, and fourth is uh, regional issues such as Iran, Syria, uh, Afghanistan, and Myanmar. And particularly, I think that during the meeting between Wendy Sherman and uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, and, and uh, Xie Feng, you know, they specifically talked about the situation in uh, Afghanistan and also in, in Myanmar. So uh, I think in Afghanistan, what US and China wants to see uh, is, is a peaceful transition uh, to, to a new uh, power, uh, uh, hopefully a, a coalition government. Uh, and of course, you know, a post-war Afghanistan does need a lot of developmental assistance. You know, whether US is able to do it or not, you know, I, I doubt it. I think there will be, <laughs> all kinds of hearings in the coming years about you know, what has happened uh, in Afghanistan, you know, what has caused the, the fiasco 
uh, during the evacuation and all the other things. So China obviously is going to be in a better position uh, to, to provide uh, support, to, to enable uh, this, this country uh, to, to become normal uh, again. But I, I think, you know, if you're looking for low-hanging fruit in terms of quickly identifying and implementing a bilateral cooperation, that's going to be in Myanmar. Uh, particularly not about you know how uh, the military is going to return power uh, to the civilian uh, government but about controlling uh, covid-19 situation to provide more vaccine and also to to prevent uh, Myanmar from uh, going into a humanitarian disaster because of the coup the economy is collapsing and because of the massive civil disobedient uh, movement you know the government has literally shut down. So if the US and China do not coordinate their uh, policies uh, to work with uh, United Nations and ASEAN, then uh, Myanmar will be on the verge of, of a collapse. Although I'm critical uh, of uh, President Biden's uh, China policy, uh, I uh, praise him and his team for lifting the restrictions on uh, foreign students to come to study in the US uh, starting August of, of this year. So the Chinese students and other international students are no longer subject to, to COVID uh, restrictions in the name of national security. I, I think we, we have all seen the report is how many Chinese students are returning. And of course, new Chinese students are also uh, coming because they've been just uh, admitted by American colleges and universities. We see the long line at Shanghai Pudong Airport, you know, seeing parents, you know, uh, sending their, their children off uh, to, to the US. You know, th this, this is important. It shows that uh, on the US side, you know, they're still welcoming uh, international students and the Chinese students, you know, despite the fact that uh, uh, when uh, US uh, council, uh, are deciding whether they're going to issue visa to some students. You know, uh, there are visas that are denied because students are trying to learn a major in a sensitive subject over here. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, from the China side, you know, the the fact that so many Chinese students are coming here, uh, you know, considering how bad the relationship is and considering how serious. COVID-19 situation is, it, it shows, you know, they still have a positive feeling, positive attitude toward the US. So I always say when government to government relationship goes low, uh, people to people relationship should go high and much higher because now really the people to people uh, relationship are cushions, you know, so that at least the, the government to government relationship is if it's going to fall, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a, a soft landing. You know, a hard landing will, will be disastrous for, for, for both uh, countries. I also want to call uh, the Chinese government uh, to reconsider uh, its uh, border control. You know, how are you going to uh, regulate uh, foreigners visiting, you know, particularly the mandatory three week uh, quarantine uh, that that's too big a burden, and uh, if you're going to welcome athletes from all over the world to participate in the Winter Games, and if you want reporters to, to come to China, so China will have to come up with a with a solution. And if that uh, wall of control is going to be lowered, uh, then more people will be able to travel to to, to China because this whole control uh, has now become a huge booster to the decoupling uh, that is taking place between US and, and China.